Let me give you a real quick uh, uh, recap. Uh, I know some people that do series teaching like this, and, and they'll go back and recap, and they just cover everything they did the first time. That's not what we need to do. All right. Uh, we talked about the, the four doors of opportunity, and in the book of Revelation, chapter 3, it talks about the fact that God opens doors, no man can shut those doors. God shuts doors, and no man can open those doors. And we looked at the door of salvation, which is an absolute necessity. It is the first door. Without going through the door of salvation, none of the rest of these even mean anything to you. For it's absolutely impossible to worship God in the flesh. It's absolutely impossible to worship God as a natural man. Ye must be born again. And so after you go through the door of salvation, the door of worship is possible for you, and you can do that. And I believe, as the Bible teaches, that the greatest place of worship is the house of God. Amen. You go back and look in the Old Testament when they were building the tabernacle in the wilderness. What was the purpose of the tabernacle in the wilderness? It was the fact. God was there and they could come and worship him there. Then when the permanent temple was built uh, uh, in Solomon's day, uh, David wanted to build it, but God would not allow that. But Solomon built the temple and it was for the purpose of worship. And we looked at the verse where it said, I would like to be a doorkeeper, the house of God. Well, what's the purpose of that door? It's to let us in so that we can worship God. Now tonight... We're going to look at the, uh, the third door, which is the door of fellowship. All right? The door of fellowship. In Revelation chapter 3 uh, and verse 14, the Bible says this. And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich, and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear." And anoint thine eyes with eye salve that, they, that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Boy, that was something hard for me to understand when I was a kid. Yeah. My dad tells me that he loves me, and that's why he's giving me a whooping. Now, y'all notice how I worded that, right? My mama would give me a whipping. My daddy gave me a whooping, and it's two different things. I promise you it is. And he would even make a statement like this. This hurts me worse than it does you. And I said, you've got to be kidding. <laughs> he did that because he loved me. And when God takes you to the woodshed, it's because he loves you. Right. And something else that we'll discover as we're studying this, it's because you're his. Yeah, right. Amen. Yes, sir. He whips his own children. He chastens his own children. He said, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Now look at verse 20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. To him that overcometh will I grant to set with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my father in his throne. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Now, I know this, that this particular passage of Scripture is considered by some people to represent the idea of Jesus knocking on the door of your heart so that you might be saved. And I know that. And there are uh, even a very famous painting supposedly depicts that. That Jesus comes to the, the door of your heart and knocks on it and wants to come in to save you. The only problem is that's not the context of what's being said here. Right. And it's being said in a different way which explains that that's not what's taking place. Right. Jesus is knocking on the door because he wants to come in and sup with you. He wants to have fellowship right. yes, with you. Now, this door is shut. 
And Jesus is knocking on it. Now, that's not a contradiction to the first part of Revelation 3 when it said that God opens the door no man can shut or God shuts the door no man can open. You say, well, this door is shut and Jesus can't come in. Oh, yes, he can come in. He's asking you, can he come in? Yeah. He wants to have fellowship with you. Yeah. And fellowship with God has to be a wonderful thing. Yeah. Think about that. Don't you know some people that you just like to be around? Sure. And probably when I said that, you said, there's some people I don't like to be around, too. Well, that might be true. But there's some folks, you just, you just love to be around them. They're such a blessing to you. They're such an encouragement to you. And, such, and, and, and they just help you along the way. Jesus says, can I come in? I, I want to fellowship with you. I want to walk with you, and I want you to walk with me. I want that intimacy. I want that closeness. Now, what this is referring to in this passage... It's not salvation, it's fellowship. Now, uh, let me show you some reasons why, and then, then we'll go on from there. Uh, when God calls something the church, He knows exactly what He's talking about. Right, right. He calls this the church of the Laodiceans, and we'll look at that in just a moment. But He said, I, I, and I know this, that, that uh, wheat and tares grow together. Sure. The Bible teaches that as well. See, there are folks that are members of a church on a roll that don't know Jesus. But there are folks that do know Jesus, and when God calls them a church, He's calling them because they're saved, that, that giving them that title. And He calls this the church. And it also says here that He would rebuke and chasten them, and chastisement is only for His children. So if He's referring to them that way, those that I love, I'll rebuke and I will chase. And he's talking about his own children. Uh, Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 6 tells us this. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. Right. Okay? If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? But if ye be without chastisement, Whereof all are partakers. All means all those that are his children right. are partakers. Then are ye bastards and not sons. In other words, you're not his. Right. You're claiming to be, but you're not his. So when, when, when Jesus in this passage is talking about coming to them, and he said, you're the ones that I'm going to rebuke, I'm going to chasten, because you're not right with me. If they were right with the Lord at that point in the way they were walking, he wouldn't have to be at the door knocking. Right. He'd already be in there. Right. Already having fellowship with them. But the fact that now he's having to knock on the door is because that fellowship had been broken by something. And we see it really at the very beginning of this particular passage of Scripture when he says that he's writing to the church, notice in the, in the Word now, of the Laodiceans. Now there are seven churches mentioned in Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3. None of them have that type of wording but this one. Every other time, it either uses the word of or in to refer to a location. The church at Thyatira, the church at Ephesus, or it refers to a place. If you'll notice, it doesn't say that in Revelation 3. It says the church of the Laodiceans. Now, where's the church located? Well, it's located in Laodicea. But that's not the way it's worded. Right. And always remember this. God's Word's perfect. Yes. Right, right. And so if it's worded differently, it's worded differently for a reason. Yeah. I'll, I'll give you an example. Don't you say, and can you not say this in a proper way, this is my church. Couldn't you do that? And, and don't you think you could have the right intentions in making that statement? Okay. But this is not your church. If it is your church, it becomes a church of the Laodiceans. The church of the Laodiceans was basically run by the Laodiceans. 
It's interesting that the, the term Laodicea means just people. Not just as in righteous, but they're just people. And we understand from that that the church of the Laodiceans believed in the people's rights. We have the right of doing this the way we want to do it. The Bible says that this church belongs to God. Christ paid for it. And he's the head of it. Emmanuel Baptist Church has an under-shepherd who is to follow the Lord. And as he follows the Lord, we are to follow him. That's a church in Florence. Yes. Yes. That's not a church of the people of Florence. Right. The difference here is they had become so self-sufficient. They thought they had it all down pat, knew exactly how to do this, cross every T, dot every I. And Jesus said, you don't even know how far away from me you've gotten. You're so far away, I have to knock on the door to come have fellowship with you. Do you lock your doors at your house? Some people don't. There was a time in my life when I didn't. When I was younger and I thought the world wasn't quite as crazy. But now... I lock the doors. Yeah. What's so sh such a shame is sometimes they lock the doors on Jesus at the church. Amen. And Jesus, we just don't think you fit in with the program this week. Because we're going to do what we want to do and the way we want to do it. They had become the church of the Laodiceans. And because of that, they did not have fellowship with God. Saved? We've already seen that they're saved. He said, the ones that I love, I rebuke and chasten. He only chastens his own. They're, all, they're saved. But they're not having fellowship with God. If I can understand this reasonably... You can be saved and not be walking with God. But that's not the way it should be. And there's some, there's some uh, things that we want to look at tonight of why we don't walk with God. Why we don't have the fellowship that we should have. Uh, I think I mentioned this maybe last week. Uh, sometimes... My study and my messages kind of all run together in my head. But always, it's a good eye, just a thing to remember, that God's right always. And if you're right with God, you will be right with what He says. If not, you're not walking with Him. So you're not in fellowship. He's always right, and He's narrow-minded. He says it's either his way or it's wrong. Right, right. Yeah. So, now, the only way we'll ever have fellowship with God is to agree with what I just said. Yeah, He's always right. Yeah. And the only way I'll be right is to be right with him. Yeah. Yeah. And if he has to knock on the door, I'm not right with him. Yeah. Because you shouldn't have a locked front door to the Lord. Good. He ought to be able to just walk right in. Yeah. Right, okay? Now... In this passage of Scripture, uh, it explains to us something that helps us to understand why there was no fellowship. The Bible says that they were in a condition of lukewarmness. Yeah. Now, for, as, I, as I looked at this, it, it, just, it, it describes it so clearly, but it, it's right there. What makes something lukewarm? All right, It's a mixture between something that's hot and something that's cold. When you mix those two together, it becomes lukewarm. 
What's another word for lukewarmness? Compromise. Now, if God's right always, He's always hot. Yeah, that's right. Yes, right. In my lost condition, I was always cold. Yeah. I was lost. Right. We don't need to mix God as hot with me as cold and come out with a good product. It's a lukewarm product. It's compromise. Yeah. The only way that we can be what God would have us to be, we can't compromise with who He is and the way He wants us to live and what His Word says. You cannot compromise with that. You can't be lukewarm. Right. Lukewarmness, the Bible clearly says, makes God sick. Yeah. Right. Sick. Yeah. Amen. Can you think of something that repulses you so much it makes you sick? I can think of some things. Yeah. Our lukewarmness makes God sick. God but He still wants to come in. Right. Yeah. He loves us that much. But He's going to come in on His terms. Right. If we're going to have fellowship with God, we'll have to do it his way. Lukewarmness is nothing more than a compromise between hot and cold. It's a mixture. All right, let me ask you a question. How much, um, I told uh, Brother Tony last week that I, I did, don't hardly ever use water, and so I noticed there's not one up here tonight. So I'm going to use that as an illustration. It's not here. Let's just assume that there's a cup sitting right here, and it's full of water. How much poison would I have to put in that cup of water to have, to have it poisoned? You say, well, I don't know. Well, maybe that's our problem. It only takes whatever you put in it to contaminate it. No matter what the percentage is. At some point, it was pure water. And when you add something to it, it's become compromised. Right, right. It's contaminated. Right. I mean, how, how far away from God do you need to be to be away from God? Yeah, that's good. That's good. Just a little is all it takes. Yeah, right. And you're not where you should be. Now, I'm going to show you the scripture about this in just a moment. Fellowship only takes place when there's a pure relationship between you and God. But when something comes in that alters that, that all of a sudden takes it in a lukewarm direction, that compromise is poison. And it's, and it's putting Jesus outside. He's not going to walk with that. He's not going to be in agreement with that. One of my favorite verses in the Bible, uh, uh, the first time I ever saw this after I got saved and I came across it in some study and, and I come, came across this verse and I said, boy, that is just so good. That's so clear. It's so simple. We probably don't get it, but it's just so simple. Amos chapter 3 and verse 3 says, can two walk together except they be agreed? Amen. What a verse. Right. In other words, if you don't walk with God in agreement with God, you're not walking with God. Because if you walk with God, you're going to be walking in agreement with God. God doesn't walk on our terms. God walks on His terms. Fellowship is on God's terms. Fellowship is found by walking in the light. 1 John chapter 1 and verse 5, the Bible says this. This then is the message which we have heard of Him and declare unto you that God is light, and in Him is no darkness at all. No compromise in who He is. He is pure light. In Him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with Him, 
and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. First of all, notice that the light of God has no darkness. <clears throat> Most people want to live their life in the gray. I mean... Don't ask me to be a fanatic. Don't expect too much from me. I mean, I know what the Bible says, but don't really expect me to be holy. I mean, don't you think that's too high of an expectation? Well, it may be a high expectation, but Jesus said, be holy as I'm holy. And in him's no darkness. There's no compromise. I know this is not very popular, but your opinion really doesn't matter to God. <laughs> this is the way I think we ought to do it. This is the direction I think we ought to go in. And God says, well, no. You're going to find me on the outside doing this. When you do that, I'm not going to walk with that. I'm not in agreement with that. And you can't walk with me if you're walking in the shadows a mixture compromise if you're going to walk with him he is the light and you have to walk in the light with him in agreement that's fellowship it's a great opportunity don't you see that you get to fellowship with God I mean, there's people that are famous in the world that I couldn't even get to see them or even call them on the phone. I get to fellowship with God. Amazing. Amazing. But I can only do it on His terms. There are no shades of compromise with God. There are no gray areas with God. Matter of fact, this is what he said. He said, I'm yay, yay, or nay, nay. I'm saying it's either this way, or it's not that way. That's it. We love compromise. Let's admit to it. We like middle ground. Let's, let's, let's work this out. So God says, first of all, you'll never be saved unless you come through the door, which is Jesus Christ. There is no other way. There's no compromise there. If you're going to worship me, you must worship me in spirit and in truth. There's no compromise there. And he said, if you're going to have fellowship with me, you must walk in the light as I'm in the light. If you don't do that, you're not having fellowship with me. You're walking. Uh, there was a, 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 a gentleman. He was a deacon at the church down in South Carolina when I was there. And he used to almost say this in, in every prayer he ever prayed. He said, uh, Lord, I'm praying for those that are walking at a guilty distance. He used that term. Wow. A guilty distance. He was talking about people that he believed were saved, but they're not walking in fellowship with God. Mercy. A guilty distance. Something's there. It shouldn't be there. And as a result of that, it's poisoned your relationship with God. How much does it take? When it goes past pure, it's contaminated. I'm old enough to remember 99 and 44, 100 percent pure dove soap. And the young ones in here looked at me and said, what did that mean? That was their advertising campaign. And you know why they were saying that? They said it was the purest soap on the market. 99 and 44, 100% pure. Can I tell you something? That soap's contaminated. It had a lot of purity to it. But how much does it take to no longer be pure? Fellowship 
fellowship. It's based on the light. And in the light, there's no darkness at all. Compromise adds a shadow of darkness to the light, and therefore it's no longer a walk in the light. It's a walk in the shadows. When you walk in the shadow of compromise, you're no longer walking in the light. Compromise may be applauded by the shadow dwellers. Now, that's a new term that I came up with, talking about religious folk. They're the shadow dwellers. I'm going to add a little bit of what the Bible says with a little bit of what I think, and that's going to be my religious walk. That's walking in the shadows. You have to walk by the light. Light doesn't compromise. Light's true. Uh, you know, we just need to give up. Maybe this will help. A, a practical, simple definition of what darkness is. Okay? It is anything contrary to the light of God. Anything. And there's some, there's some subjects being talked about in our day. I never thought they'd be discussed up for debate, but they are, you know. And we might look at that and say, well, that's just so obvious. Well, it's not being so obvious to some people, or they wouldn't be debating it. But well, what about those things that we don't think are so bad? What, what are they? They're compromised with the light. They're compromised. Anything that's contrary to the light of God is anything that's contrary to the standard of the doctrine of the Word of God. That's why religion clouds doctrine. Yes. Yes. Because doctrine sets it straight. Yeah. True. True. God says it's my way or you're wrong. Yeah. Right? The Bible says in Psalm 119 and verse 105, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. That's what you need to follow. The word of God, the light of the word of God cannot lead you in a wrong direction. It cannot take you down a wrong path. It will not tell you the wrong thing. But when we start to compromise, all of a sudden something happens, it changes. Psalm 119 and verse 130 says this, The entrance of thy words giveth light, it giveth understanding unto the simple. Now, <clears throat> I appreciate this very much, but there were folks who have told me that uh, um, when you teach, it makes it simple so I can understand it. All right, let me tell you what the word simple means. Y'all ready? Simple means to be ignorant. Now, before you get the wrong idea about that, I didn't say simple means to be dumb. Simple means to be ignorant, which simply means you don't know something. That's all ignorance is. Ignorance is something you don't know. All right? Notice what this says. The entrance of his word giveth light, and by the way, in that light is no darkness at all. He gives light, it giveth understanding unto the simple, to the ignorant, to the ones that don't know. Where are you going to learn what you need to learn? You're going to learn it from the world? You're going to learn it from religion? Or are you going to learn it from the light? The light gives the simple understanding. Darkness is actually simple for the natural man to believe. Sure. But the light shows the simple that the darkness is wrong. That the way of the world is wrong. That living in this world apart from a walking relationship with God is wrong. There are people who are applauded all the time for these great things they're doing. I'm telling you, it will mean absolutely nothing in eternity. Right. Right. Nothing. But I gave $10 million to this charitable organization. Great. You can die without God, and you'll go to hell. And 
You can give $10 million if you have $10 million, and you can give that to some great charitable organization because you're so wonderful or because you just like for somebody to come pat you on the back. How wonderful a person you are to do that. This is what I found. If, if we're going to walk in fellowship with God, everything about us is going to be about Him. Everything. I heard this early on in my Christian life. It said if uh, uh, somebody, you know, pats you on the back, tells you how wonderful something was, says, say thank you and move on. Don't linger there. You'll start to get the big head. But if somebody comes up to you and criticizes you, stop and listen. You know, they could just be right. Yeah. right. Yeah. There's something you might need to change. Yeah. And when you have done that, then change and move on. Yeah. But it's got to be about Him. Fellowship is about Him. Yeah. We get to enjoy that, but our fellowship must first be with Jesus. He's the light. He always walks in the light. If we have fellowship with Him, we walk with Him His way. Since He does not compromise His Word, if we walk with Him, we don't compromise His Word. We don't walk in fellowship with those that have compromised His Word. Now this is where it gets me to some people's thinking. All right? It might sound callous, condescending, even arrogant. But I assure you it's not. It is a necessity to keep out darkness. Because darkness compro uh, will compromise light. You've got to keep the darkness out. You've got to keep out the contamination. You've got to keep out the compromise. If these things are not removed from our lives then we cannot walk with fellowship in the light. And Jesus says, could I come in? I'm not welcome there right now. Can I come in? I have to come in on my terms, but can I come in? If we take this stand of uncompromising fellowship, then I promise you we're going to be criticized by the shadow dwellers. Religion hates that. Y'all know that. I mean, they think you're nuts. Yeah. Right. <laughs> when we were in St. Lucia, I had somebody tell me this. Oh, God, the pastor's already told you I taught this down there. And we were sitting around the, uh, the table eating lunch, and uh, there were several pastors there. You know, uh, uh, I think this particular pastor was from Trinidad. And we were talking about some things, and they'd asked me some questions, and I, I was trying to answer those questions and whatnot. And this is what he said. He said, you know what the young preachers would call you? And the first thing crossed my mind, which is a, actually a term I referred to myself as, I said, yeah, they'd call me a dinosaur. And he said, no, 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 no. They would call you a purist. And I sat there for just a second, and I said, you tell them thank you. Because a purist, I guess, wouldn't have any room for darkness, would he? He wouldn't have any room for compromise. You see, I believe God said what he said, meant what he said, and we ought to follow what he said. I don't believe we need to figure it out or, or uh, rethink it, you know? But if you're not careful, you'll find yourself letting the shadow dwellers convince you that that's just too... That's, you, you, just, you expect too much. You just expect too much. Galatians chapter 1. Verse 6. I marvel 
that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another. But there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. I had a situation happen not very long before I left Gatewood coming up here. I was studying and I came across this particular passage of Scripture, this verse, and got to studying a word here, which that's what I usually do. And I preached one Sunday morning on the subject of you are a pervert. Now, you can tell that went over well, can't you? you know, I just look at your face and tell. If you'd have been sitting there that morning, I would have been looking at you. You're a pervert. Now, let me give you something about the definitions of words. Oftentimes, we try to define words as they are defined today. Uh, that's why I use old dictionaries like 1828 dictionaries. Yes. The word pervert or to pervert something means to change it from its natural state. All right? Now, what it's become is something with a sexual connotation to it. All right? But the actual word itself means if you take something that's right and change it, you have perverted it. And when you do that, you're a pervert. All right? What's being said here in verse 7, it says they would pervert the gospel of Christ. They were perverts. They were perverting what was right. They were adding something to or taking something away. They were not giving the light. They were giving shadows. They were giving darkness things. And they were throwing out something. That, and the Bible clearly says that's not another gospel. There's only one. There's only one. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which you, we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. Well, that's a strong word. And, we, and we, as we said uh, before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that has received, let him be accursed. For do I now persuade men or God? Don't even think that you can do this. That you can win God over to your side. Paul said, do I persuade men or do I... Can I, can I persuade God? Or am I going to change God's mind about this? If you've been paying any attention or heard anything about it at all, there are, are denominations in our day that are debating issues. And in order to debate those issues, they are coming up with the idea that they're going to change God's mind as to what God said was right. If they were not trying to do that, there'd be no debate. I had, a, I had a dear friend that came to me. He said the church that he'd been going to for over 50 years, he said he was telling me some of the things that they're doing and they're talking about. And, and I asked him a simple question. I said, why are you still there? And he said, but I've been there all of these years. Now, by the way, if you let God give you something, if you just, sometimes you just shut up long enough for him to do it, he'll give you the right thing to say. I said, all right, let me ask you a question. I mean, this just came out, I say came out of the blue, but you know. I said, let me ask you a question. Fifty years ago, when you first went to this church, if they were having that debate then, would you have stayed? He said, oh, no. I said, well, why are you now? Why are you now? If you're going to stay, you have to contaminate the light. 
You have to compromise the truth. You say, but, but, I said, no. No, 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 no. The, the only time you ought to use the word but is when the Bible says, but God. Yeah. Don't, don't but this situation. This is not a but situation. If you're going to walk in fellowship with God, you've got to walk out of that. Because God's not walking in that. That's not where he is. He said, should I persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I yet pleased men, I should not be the servant of Christ. I'm not walking in fellowship. But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. For neither uh, received it of man, neither I received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, Paul said, I know whom I have believed. And am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Paul said, I am committed to God. I am persuaded that I believe what God has shown me and nothing is going to darken that. I'm not going to let any darkness in. I'm not going to let any, any something to kind of weasel its way in and water it down to where it starts to become lukewarm. What Paul was not when he made that statement, Paul was not simple. He was no longer ignorant. He knew something. I've made the statement in the past that preacher got, if a preacher gets up this Sunday morning and preaches for 45 minutes on adultery, he cannot make me feel guilty. It's very simple. I'm not guilty. Because there's some things that I know and I'm settled. You can't move me from them. Now, I'm not, I'm not, don't get the wrong idea about that. I can mess up and all of a sudden Jesus is knocking on the door. But you can't make me feel guilty over something that's settled that I'm not doing. We need to be settled. We need to be people walking in the light, not in the dark. All right? Let me give you these verses. Joshua chapter 6 and verse 18. And ye, in any wise, keep yourselves from the accursed thing. Because if you don't, it'll affect you. It'll darken your walk. Yeah. Yeah. Acts 15, 29. That ye abstain from meats offered to idols, and from blood, and from things strangled, and from fornication, from which if ye keep yourselves, ye shall do well. Fare ye well. First John 5, 21. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. Yeah. I like simple definitions for things. What's an idol? Anything between you and God. Right. Doesn't have to be a statue that you bow down and kiss the toe of it. Anything that's between you and God. It's got in the way. That's an idol. Could be a lot of things. Could be a lot of things that you might even say, oh, those are good things. But good things can get between you and God. And when something gets between you and God, a compromise is taking place. Keep yourself from idols. Jude one twenty one says, keep yourselves in the love of God. Romans 16.17 gives us something that we need to understand in this day when they say, well, you're just judging. No. If you go with, the, with the, what the Bible says, you'll understand. It said, now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned and hang in there with them. Now the Bible says and avoid them. Why? Because poison contaminates Darkness causes shadows that don't need to be there. <clears throat> Boy, I get to do this tonight. Sorry about the thing up here, but if you want to follow me, I'm going over here. 
I'm going to give you an illustration. I've used this many times. We're going to say this wall represents the absolute perfect will of God. Okay? Y'all with me? That wall this not, had, has nothing to do with the people sitting here, okay? That wall over there is the devil personified. Horrible, wicked, heinous, things, I mean, just unimaginable. That's what this wall represents. Now, where do you think the devil wants you? Don't look over there. Because this is where the devil wants you. You ready? That's where he wants you. Now, he's got you going in that direction. But this is where he wants you. And this is compromise. Because you know what happens after this? Somewhere along the line, you say, how did I end up in this pig pen? Well, I've heard it described that the prodigal son went to the pig pen one step at a time. Just a little bit. I'm, I don't want to do something horrible. I just want to dabble a little bit. Go in that direction. Good. If you're going to walk with people that are walking here, yeah. they're going to take you that way. Right. You need to walk with the Lord. Right. And the Lord never leaves the wall, right. He never leaves the light. And in him, there's no darkness at all. <clears throat> Philippians chapter 3 and verse 17. Brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them which walk so as ye have us for an ensample. That is a true statement that was written down under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God. And having said that, if that was not the case, that's just downright arrogant. Paul said, all these other people are crazy. You just follow me and you'll be all right. But Paul could make that statement because Paul was walking on the wall. He was over there. He was making sure that the light was in his life. Yeah. Here's a good thing to remember. How long does it take you to get something right when God shows you it's wrong? Mm -hmm. It's a good test. Yeah. Because you are going to do something wrong. Sure. Right. All of us are. Sure. How long does it take you to get it right? Good. Now, if you immediately, when God shows it to you, Lord, forgive me. It, doesn't he say he'll do that? Yes. And where's he going to put you? Back over there. But I'm going to tell you, the longer it takes you, the dirtier you get, the darker you get. It starts to grow and keeps on pulling you in that direction. Fellowship. I was going to try to get this far, and I did. Matthew chapter 5, verse 13. You're the salt of the earth, but if the salt have lost his savor, something's wrong. Yep. Do you know why that salt lost its savor? It's contaminated. Yep. It's been compromised. Yep. It's not serving a pure purpose anymore. Right. It's lost its savor. Wherewith shall it be salted? It is henceforth for good for nothing. 
compromising Christians don't represent God well. Walking in the shadow does not represent God well. Matter of fact, he said what you're supposed to do is put your light out there on a hill where everybody can see it. Don't put it under a bushel. Don't hide it. The salt had lost its savor. It's good for nothing but to be cast out and be trodden under the foot of men. Now that's very important to understand. Okay? If it's trodden under the foot of men, that means that you have put yourself under the authority of man rather than the authority of God. That's why man just walk on you. How does salt lose its savor? Contamination. Compromise. It puts you under the feet of men, for you've chosen to place their philosophy over the truth of God. Compromise places man in a superior position over God. I mean, if you really believe God's who He is, why would you doubt what He says? Why would you question what He says? Why would you try to water down what he says? Compromise says that God's word is not settled, but it's in a state of opinionated flux. Isn't that what's happening? We need to, we need to have discussions about what the Bible really means in this passage right here. I mean, it's meant the same thing for the last you know, 2,000 years, but we need to question it now because we're so much smarter. I mean, we've arrived. Y'all know that, right? It doesn't look like to me we've arrived. It looks like to me we're getting worse. But that's the very reason why the compromise is happening. The debates of our day, they're ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. That, that's, the, that's the day in which we live. Now, here, here's, here's a simple thing to think about, and then I, I'm, we'll pick this up next week. Uh, if things are getting worse don't you think that those that are walking with God shine brighter don't you think I was a uh, when I was a senior in high school I played in the band, and I was a drummer, and y'all know that. Uh, but we were having uh, uh, district competition, state competition, band competition. And when I was a junior, I won first chair in the competition. And I went up there as a senior, and I was going to try to repeat as that. <clears throat> and when I got there that day, some of the people that I was competing with, they thought it was great when they saw what had happened to me. The night before I left to go up there, I shut the car door on my thumb. And have you ever heard something sticking out like a sore thumb? You ever heard that phrase? Well, that's what I was doing. I was walking around like this all day long. Now, this is a little bit tough to play drums like this. I I had a cup of ice, and I would stick it down in there some during the day or whatever. Sticking out like a sore thumb. They thought that that gave them an inroads that day that I wouldn't be able to play I wouldn't be able to get the first chair again but the truth is that person who stuck out like a sore thumb concentrated more than he ever had and went in there to play and the judges, after I, you had to play this particular piece that you were supposed to have learned or whatever, and I played it, and they said, would you do it again? Just do it slower. And I did it again. And they said, would you do it again? Just play it slower. Okay, I did it the third time. They said, thank you, and I left. Well, I took first chair again. I kept slowing down because they couldn't keep up with me. I was sticking out like a sore thumb. There was something different. 
They could see something different. They thought, now listen to me, they thought that was against me. And when the world looks at you and you stick out like a sore thumb, they think that's against you. They think you're crazy for loving God like that. Sure. But don't do it because you want to be arrogant. Yeah. Right. But do it because you're walking with God. You want your life to just radiate who He is. Yeah. Right. Let the world see that. Sure. And say, no, I don't have to compromise to be a Christian. I don't have to compromise. I might have to compromise to go to some places. Sure. But those are not the places I need to be. Sure. I think I ought, to, I ought to fit in some place where there's a bunch of sore thumbs sticking out. Yeah. Yeah. How about you? Who's your fellowship with? Good. All right. We're going to be dismissed with this. Have pastor come up. Lord gave me this little definition. You ready? fellowship fellowship two fellas in the same ship rowing in the same direction with the same purpose and goal that's fellowship fellowship two fellas in the same ship rowing in the same direction Amen. with the same purpose and goal if you are going to have fellowship with God, you have to have the same purpose He has, yeah. the same goal He has, yeah. to go the same direction He's going in. Yeah. That's fellowship, and the fellowship is in agreement yeah. with God. Yeah. Are we walking in fellowship, or do we find ourselves sometimes at a guilty distance I don't want to be able to kind of see the light off in a distance I want to be able to walk in it which is what he said we should do that's fellowship we have that opportunity are we, are, are we going through that door it's a great opportunity you'll never regret it I promise you Anytime you go through God's doors, you'll never regret it. Right. Are we doing that? Let's pray. Lord, thank you tonight for the opportunity to, to be here and to do this. And Lord, your word is just wonderful and, and precious, and, and it's light. <laughs> I mean, it's just right. Help us to align ourselves with it and uh, to walk in agreement, Lord. Uh, May we be rowing uh, in the same direction and the same desires. May we delight ourselves in you and follow you the way you would have us to go. Lord, what a great, this is a great opportunity and a great privilege for me to be able to stand here tonight. I thank you, Lord, for it for that open door that you gave me. Lord, and I pray that something could be said. That will be a help and a blessing. For it's in Christ's name we do pray. Amen. Did you know that you could receive a daily devotion every morning in your inbox? Head on over to ibcflorence.com and click on Daily Devotions to sign up today. And as always, thanks for listening.